We think the best thing for you to do is to have an amputation. Around 4 million people in the UK have type 2 diabetes. We need to talk about this to decide what to do. It's mostly preventable, but it can be deadly. It slowly came on, you see. The trigger, bad diet and lack of exercise. Half past four, going for more chocolate. The result, all too often. There's a blockage in the artery. Heart failure, kidney disease, feet and legs that must be amputated. Say yes to me when I'm touching your feet. Nothing. No, OK. So I will just cut it, leave it open. I will have performed two amputations alone today. It's an invisible illness, and it basically rots your organs from the inside. It used to be a disease of the middle-aged and elderly. How old are you now, then, Uh, 15. He's got a whole lifetime ahead of him with diabetes. Just as the disease slowly grips a patient, the costs are slowly strangling the NHS. We are in a crisis now. Panorama has spent six months at the sharp end of the battle against this rising epidemic. We are very much putting out the fires, and whilst that is my job to do that, I would very much wish that these fires didn't exist in the first place. Hi, Martin Claridge. Right, thanks. I'll see you there in a minute. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. -bye. The vascular ward at Hartland's Hospital in Birmingham deals with very severe, acute complications of diabetes every day. We give you some glucose as well in the, in the bag of fluid. John Westwood is a type 2 diabetic. He has gangrene in his foot and his life is in danger from infection. I was watching a television and there was a radiator at the end of the seat. And, you know, I must have just pushed my feet against it. But it was cold. And then in the night, they turn themselves on, you know, to... Oh, you should have seen my feet in the morning. Absolute blisters all over. What is horrible. John's diabetes means he has lost sensation in his feet and his wounds won't heal. Hello. Mr Westwood, hello, nice to meet you. I'm Martin Claridge, vascular surgeon. Well, I'm saying you've got a problem with your foot. I burned it on a radiator. It was all blisters. Well, up to Friday, it was, it was healing, right. no problem. And then all Friday, of a I said there's something wrong. That's when we call the ambulance. Right, okay. All right, is it okay if we have a look? Okay. When this happened, what, about three weeks ago, did it? Yeah. Okay, thank you. With you, my friend, the infection is so much in the sole of your foot and so spread up your foot that I can't save your foot, I'm afraid. So what you need to do is have an emergency operation to have your foot removed. So it's, it's what we call a guillotine amputation. Yeah. So we take all the infected tissue away and then it allows the non-dead tissue that's only a little bit infected to, to settle down and then we can actually finish off your operation Afterwards, with what's yeah. called a below knee amputation. If we don't do that, then what's going to happen is the infection is going to spread up your leg and you'll end up losing much more of your leg. And ultimately, you would succumb from this if we don't do this. No. So we have to get on and get this sorted out for you. OK. Is that all right? Yes, it is all right. OK. I'll do my best, for us, as I can't do it. No, well, it's very difficult to do anything more than you can with this That's situation, right. yeah. So it needs, it, needs, it needs some surgery yes, now. Yeah. He needs an emergency amputation of his foot. If we don't get on and get on, get this done in the next few hours, he's going to lose his leg or potentially his life. He's very, he I think doesn't moan. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't moan, yeah. you say. When they tell you, you're in shock. You blanked off. When the injury happened, John and his wife Pat were away on a special trip. Our son had paid for us to have a holiday in Cornwall for our 50th wedding anniversary. Things happened to him, and knockbacks. But I tell you something, it's never got him down. And if he wasn't like that, I'd know there was something wrong. That's the reason I knew there was something wrong with him, when he wouldn't eat. And I thought, that's not him. Type 2 diabetes means the body's natural insulin system stops working. The resulting high blood sugar levels clog up veins and arteries and that can lead to acute complications. Thank you. 
Type 2 diabetes causes furring up of the really small blood vessels. This can rapidly escalate uh, and cause gangrene, cause toes to be lost, uh, cause foot loss and may result in amputations. Type 1 diabetes, the sort you're born with, accounts for just a tenth of cases. It's type 2, mostly brought on by lifestyle, that's now flooding Heartland's Hospital with new patients. Birmingham has one of the highest levels of diabetes in the UK. An estimated one in 10 people here has it. The hospital has spent six million pounds building a dedicated center to cope with the diabetes epidemic. This is our main reception area where the patients come in. We see about eight to 9,000 patients every year. We deal with a huge range of problems resulting from diabetes. Patients with damage to their nerves in the feet, patients requiring regular dialysis, patients having severe eye disease. Keep looking there. The prevalence of diabetes is increasing so rapidly that it is three times the number of all the cancers combined together. Nine out of ten type 2 diabetes patients are overweight or obese. Jonathan, how are you today? Okay, how are you? I'm all right, thank you. Good. Uh, so, would you like to pop onto the scales? John O'Hagan was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes when he was 32. He's now 40. Okay, so it's 123.4. So your BMI is 41.7. With a body mass index of over 40, John is classed as severely obese. He's been told he needs to change his diet, but he's finding it hard. I probably do eat a bit too much in general. I could quite easily have four or five milkshakes a week, um, depending on opportunity as well. If I came to the weight management clinic on Monday, I could have one after that. But my big poison, if you like, is, is chocolate. Now John has to rely on medication to control his blood sugar levels. This is my daily diabetic medication. I have metformin, 500 milligram tablets. I have insulin in the form of an injection pen. I have 120 units every night. And I also have um, Victoza, which is this one. Where do you inject those? Um, into the legs, uh, tops of the thighs or lower abdomen. I try and rotate the injection site so it doesn't get sore or lumpy. The higher your blood sugar, the more invisible damage it is likely to be doing. Blood sugar is measured in millimoles per litre. Ideally, it should be below eight. We're now about half an hour, three quarters of an hour post lunch. And it's 14.3. But you feel normal? I feel normal at the moment. That, for me, is not high. It is far too high for anybody, but it's not high that I'm unused to or unfamiliar with. It's just too high. John is a psychiatric nurse, caring for patients with serious mental health problems. Unfortunately, I work in a very stressful job, and eating chocolate is my big sort of stress-relieving thing. I don't smoke. I, I rarely drink. I do go for chocolate. This is Saturday, it is quarter past five in the morning. I'm working a long day today. Just about to have breakfast, four Weetabix, topped up with Frosties and a pint of tea. We asked John to record a video diary of his regular eating habits. Thursday the 30th of June at 12.36. For lunch I have just had a large bowl of tuna pasta salad and two Ferrero Rocher. Yummy. 15.07, feeling rather tired and jaded, so I have just gone and bought a bottle of Diet Coke, um, 500 mils, and a Snickers bar. About half past four, feel tired, weary, and going for more chocolate. I will just cut it, leave it open, open, with some gauzes on it for a few days until the circulation here relaxes. John Westwood is about to have his gangrenous foot amputated. 
There is a small risk that you may die during the procedure, and the risk of that starts from around 5%. Okay, do you have any more questions? No, I think you should explain everything. Yeah. So, so we need to mark the side, okay? Just to show that it's the right leg. Please put my signature where the X is. Okay, please don't eat anything out of drink. When they go in, you think, well, are they going to come out? It's just that half of you is gone. You know, half of you ain't there. You're diabetic and your last BM was 10.5. Yeah. Okay. I'd rather that happen to me than to John. We need to do an amputation, but it's going to be a guillotine amputation. It's uh, um, the best way to stop the infection and uh, save the patient's life. Guillotine surgery is an emergency operation for the most urgent cases. The reality of amputation is brutal, and watching it is not for the faint-hearted. My name is Andreas, I'm a vascular surgeon. We're just going to do a, an uh, open amputation, so it's just a guillotine, OK? Anesthesia, can we start? Do you have a saw? No, oh, OK. Okay. Okay, very good. Okay. This went uh, quite well. I think we did well. Now the patient is going to recover. This operation has saved this man's life. I think that it did. And uh, let's hope that uh, he goes well, as we think. But diabetics don't just face the risk of amputations. Sharon Barnett is 44. She was diagnosed with type 2 nine years ago. She is worried about the damage the disease might be causing her eyes, kidneys or heart. Hello. You can stop the disease progressing if you lose enough weight and change your lifestyle. But Sharon has tried many times and still weighs 18 stone. In three weeks, she will have weight loss or bariatric surgery. She's here for a pre-op check. Preferred name, Sharon? Sharon, yeah. You are type 2 diabetic sleep. I just know I need to do it. I know that I can't carry on. It, I, it, my health problems are probably just going to get worse and worse if I don't do something about it. What do you do for your life? Um, like my work, I, yeah. I work in a call centre. Call centre? Yeah. I weigh 119 kilos at the moment. I'm now a health risk. You know, I might not live as long as I could live because I've let myself be overweight. All the best. Thank you. All Thank right. you very much. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Obesity has crept up on Sharon, the result of too little exercise and too many calories from carbohydrates and sugary foods. Oh, that's hideous. Oh, my God, where did that come from? Oh, I look really old. I was only 19. You've only got to go probably, you know, three or 400 calories a day over. And I just think it's gradually over the years just gone on. That's me there. You know, all the teams and everything. Yeah, I played like at school, I played rounders, netball, hockey, all them. When I left school, I stopped exercising. I just stopped completely. Uh, but I carried on eating the amounts I was eating. Right. Hello. How are you getting on? After the amputation, John Westwood is doing well. You look a different man, you look an awful lot better. You've got a smile there and everything, that's really good. So it's a bit of a, a, bit of a long haul over the next few days. Yeah. Well, I see you a little bit then, okay. Right. I'm going to join the Long John Silver in first states. <laughs> but I do feel 100%. No pain at all. It's absolutely amazing. Sure. All, all I'll say to you is what I told you before. If you're diabetic, 
keep on top of it. If you don't, you end up like this. It's a bad disease, a really bad disease. Could you add the image intensifier away? Vascular surgeons who treat diseases of the veins and arteries do all they can to avoid amputations. In the past, a large share of vascular problems were caused by smoking. Hello. How are you? How's your leg feeling? It used to be that it would perhaps be unusual to find a patient with diabetes, but now almost every patient I come across on the vascular ward has diabetes. The growing burden of type 2 diabetes is having a big impact right across Heartlands Hospital. Diabetes just ravages most of the systems. It has effects on the heart, has effects on the blood vessels, has effects on the kidneys, and it's just non-remitting, non-relenting, you know, it just carries on. At the back of your mind, you always think that they have a limited lifespan because there's, there's only so much you'll be able to do for them. If you've got type 2 diabetes, you're almost twice as likely to have a heart attack and over three times as likely to have kidney disease. How are you getting on with the dialysis? You all right? Yeah. Any problems, the fistula or anything? We probably get about 10 to 12 referrals a week. Probably five of them, five or six, will be diabetic, type 2 diabetic. About 40% of our patients on dialysis are type 2 diabetic. Annette visits patients at home to explain what lies ahead when they need kidney dialysis to keep them alive. It's quite difficult walking into somebody's house and they don't, they don't know what you're going to tell them. They're terrified. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, the story is the same, really, that you know, you're going to need to have dialysis and this, and this is what it entails. You know, the whole life now is going to be monopolised by the renal failure. Annette's next visit is to John Jameson. Can we go that way? John has lost weight and controlled his blood sugar well since he was diagnosed with type 2 12 years ago. But still, his kidney function has deteriorated. It is a bit tight now. It doesn't quite fit. That was um, meeting the Queen at Lord's. That was which test match was it? That was I was 12th man at Lords before I made my debut. John used to play cricket for Warwickshire and England. I was probably a little bit on the large side, but I was still reasonably quick between the wickets. But uh, after I stopped playing, wasn't doing as much exercise as perhaps I should have done, and that's when. Diabetes set in. It was much of a surprise to me that I'd, I'd, I'd got type 2 diabetes. At the end of the day, we're breaking bad news. You can almost see the cogs inside their head. They're not listening to what you've said. This the one word is going around. I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Oh my God, oh my God, I need dialysis, I need dialysis. We were chatting about Dr. Thomas and the fact that he's referred you to the renal team because the kidneys are failing and that they're there's a possibility you might need a dialysis. The diabetes, unfortunately, yeah. very common, diabetic. The first dialysis I'm going to talk to you a bit about is called peritoneal dialysis. You'd need a little procedure to put a catheter in. This is the catheter, OK? One of the dialysis bags. And basically all you're doing is connecting. Like that. It takes approximately 20 minutes. Sat there watching your cricket four times a day. So have you got any other worries or concerns at, you know, at this time? Not really. Okay. Just hope that it gets delayed as long as possible. Absolutely, and that's what we're, we're there for. Just want to say thank you for your time. No, you're welcome. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank, thank you for you. coming. I you know, cut down on meals. Basically, I'm only having one meal a day. I might have a little bit of a snack in the evening or that sort of thing, but that's basically to keep the weight off. Obviously, I want to try and avoid that. And 
whether one can do more exercise or not, but is it difficult when you've got to, to help the kidney function? They've got a catheter for it, you can't exactly go running. <laughs> do what you can when you can and enjoy life when you can. Type 2 epidemic is now affecting people much earlier in life. Just 16 years ago, there had never been a single case of a child being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in the UK. I didn't quite believe it. It wasn't in any of our medical textbooks. We didn't get taught it in medical school. So we didn't expect to see it as, a, as an issue. We just didn't think it was, we thought it was an American problem. But in the year 2000, uh, we saw the first cases in the UK here in Birmingham. <laughs> Amir is 15. He was diagnosed with type 2 when he was just 13. Hello, Mr. Hello, Rod. Amir, you okay? Yeah. People of South Asian origin are twice as likely to have type 2 diabetes, and the disease runs in his family. Amir must check his blood sugar at least four times a day. That's okay. Thank you, Amir. It's all right, Miss. Ever since I've been diagnosed, every day I'd, before lunch, I'd come down check my sugars. At first it was annoying and I can admit that I never used to come because like you know it was it was kind of hard for me to you know come down check my sugars people asking questions but then once I told them that you know it can happen to ev anyone and everyone they were actually you know quite calm at first see you on Monday. See you bye bye. Well, like no one asks questions and they understand so I kind of feel happy about that now. Being diagnosed young means life-threatening complications are likely to occur earlier in life. But as long as his blood sugar is well controlled, Amir can keep the disease at bay. I am quite rebellious when it comes to like, oh, you can't have this, you can't have that. Like, I'd go to the shops, like my mum gives me one, she says, you gotta spend it on your lunch, you're not going to shops to get chocolates or crisps or sugary drinks. And sometimes I'd like, I'd get like small chocolate bars, but then when it comes to checking my sugar results, I'm like, oh my God, I need to drink a lot of water. Amir and his mum, who also has type 2, have to come regularly to the hospital where his condition is being closely monitored. It's been three weeks since I saw him last. The glucose level for somebody who doesn't have diabetes would be between about 3.5 and about uh, 7.8, something like that. We're trying to get him to manage his glucose between 4 and 7. Once it's over about 14, actually, it's much higher than we'd like to see. So we're going to need to do a glucose check today. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. 18. 18. So that's way too high, isn't it? Uh, 18 is a, is a very high level. Um, any reason why you think your sugar was so high this morning? No, I don't know. What did you have to eat last night? Uh, normal chapati and uh, curry. Okay. The problem is, Amir, um, is, is that if, if we carry on like this at 15, by the time you get to 25, you'll get eye damage, and you've already had gout and stuff in your feet as well, and you will get these other bits of damage. So um, I'm sure you're eating healthier, which would be great, but you need to eat less. Um, okay. I'm worried in the long term because we're not winning at the moment, either in terms of his weight, which is static, or his glucose control, which is, if anything, it's worse than it has been before. Thank yeah, you. That's thank you, Doctor. All right. Thank you, then. Thank you, Emma. I think he's at a bit of a crossroads. He's got a whole lifetime ahead of him with diabetes. I'm quite gutted, actually. I mean, I, this is what I've been banging on about to him here uh, when he's missed his doses. He'll go into his own bubble. He's a nice lad. I think he finds it difficult to motivate himself. He's still eating more calories than he's burning off in exercise. I've just got to try even harder than I did before. Amir has to cut out even occasional lapses. Is the sugar in your wine Amir? I think there is. 
Um, yeah, look at this here. It's got 26 grams, 29% sugar. Oh God. You're gonna be in trouble now. Oh no. <laughs> You're gonna be in trouble. You did say to me, pick up any drink, and I just thought, Ribena, it's rich in I vitamin C. <laughs> He'll sneak you, like, he'll get snacks and not make it away to everyone that he's got them. And then we'll just find wrappers and we'll be like, oh, I didn't have that. My brother will be like, well, I did it. And my mum will be flipping, who's had it? Who's had it? And then we'll find out it was him hiding upstairs. He had it. There are now over 500 children in the UK diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And the number of new cases is rising alarmingly fast. Every new diagnosis of type 2 diabetes in children has been analysed by Amir's doctor and academic colleagues. It was August last year, so he would have been 15. Definitely got diabetes through the random glucose. We've seen twice as many children who so have been type 2 diabetes than we were in 2004-05. A striking number of the children have uh, evidence of fatty infiltration of their liver and abnormal liver function tests. 11-year-old, 12-year-old. I saw a child uh, last week who's actually developing cirrhosis of the liver. Type 2 diabetes in children may be a different disease to type 2 diabetes in adults. So adults who get this at the age of 50, whatever, may not necessarily get these other complications. But the children we've seen with type 2 seem to have got a more aggressive yeah. progress and they're getting these complications earlier than you would expect. As greater numbers of children are being diagnosed with type 2, the financial implications for the NHS in the future are grave. John O'Hagan lives with his wife, Severine, and their two children. He is still struggling to control his sugar intake. Behave yourself, Shorty. It's 6.45 on Friday the 1st of July. I've just had breakfast. Uh, four Weetabix, topped up with Frosties, and a pint of tea. And I've also had a huge amount of the chocolate slab that I was bought yesterday. Over many years, John has been unable to beat his compulsion to eat chocolate, even though it threatens to devastate his health. This I've had to buy um, because this was the chocolate that was in the, the fridge this morning. Um, which my wife had bought for our children, and um, basically I've stolen the children's chocolate, and I've now had to replace what I've stolen. I can't have anything in cupboards on show because I know that if I go out, it wouldn't be there. Do you make a habit of hiding treats and snacks and yes, things? Yes, yes, all the time. And he's very good at finding my uh, my um, secret places. Like a bloodhound for chocolate. I know. Have you tried to change him? I've stopped, really. You know, I, I've got two children to sort of try to give a good diet to, and <laughs> he's an adult. No, he's got, he's got to do it himself. I don't know, it's hard. <laughs> and he's got no will because he sniffs of chocolate and that's it. <laughs> but the gosh! Cool. Louis, cool. shush. What? It's purple. No, it's pink. Oh, right, it's pink. That's pink. You're it's right, it pink. is pink. I couldn't see it's it when you had it for a right halfway up my nose. I've suffered with depression an awful long time. Um, my first episode that I know of, I was 15. So. That's young. Yeah. My mother and grandmother both showed a lot of their love and affection through food. Um, so there was always lots sweet. Mum was a fantastic cook. So my brothers and I used to sort of compete for the, for the mixing bowl, um, which was never light on sugar. A lot of people self-medicate um, depression with booze. I don't do that. Um, a lot of uh, people with depression will smoke heavily. I don't do that anymore. Um, I eat. Even though you know that that binging and being overweight are damaging you. In, in the same way that George Best knew that when he was on his second liver, the drink was still going to kill him eventually. Didn't stop him drinking. Ah, so you sit in Mamma's chair. 
Right, I've made you both far too much. Eat, eat what you can, don't worry if you have to leave some. John has decided he can't beat his addiction on his own. 123.6. So it's gone up from when I was last seen in clinic. He too has opted for irreversible weight loss surgery. I feel quite awful that I need to seek surgery to affect the change that I need to affect, but I've tried every other means and failed. Thank you, baby. Get me. Mm -hmm. Things have got to change now because I have two children and I want to make sure I'm around to see them grow up. I want to be a part of their lives for as long as I can. If I don't look after my diabetes, I face the prospect of vascular problems, dementia, strokes, heart disease. My life expectancy reduces dramatically. I don't want that to happen. Um, and it's, it's as simple as that. I, I don't want to miss out on their lives. Take it down. Sharon's weight loss operation is imminent, but the surgery will only go ahead if she completes a strict four-week crash diet in the run-up. Until my surgery, it's 16 days. I've got to stick to less than 1,000 calories um, a day. So it's... And I'm trying to just still eat normally, but obviously just eat a lot less than what I would normally do. If my liver isn't looking good, which is what the diet's all about, it shrinks your liver, um, I, they might not do it. They might just say, no, sorry, you've not followed the diet, we're not going to do the surgery. And I would just be devastated if that happened. I do actually feel, in some ways, ashamed that I've let myself let, let this happen to me. I'm never going to be a stick insect, am I? As long as it re really, if it gets rid of the diabetes and makes me more healthy, I just want to be able to be more active and do stuff. Even going and having a dance and things. And... But nothing stops you from having a dance session. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Diabetes can have a catastrophic long-term effect on patients. There's a blockage in the artery. But it's also creating a potential catastrophe for the NHS. All aspects of healthcare that are affected by type 2 diabetes are straining at the seams, bursting at the seams, trying to manage this increasing number of patients with this complication. Each time one of these episodes occur, each time the patients come into hospital, there is a huge price tag in terms of economic cost and mobilisation of staff and resources. The NHS spends nearly a billion pounds a year on foot ulcers and amputations caused by type 2 diabetes. That's almost 1% of the entire NHS budget. We now probably need around double the number of beds that we used to have in vascular surgery to help with this influx of the disease. Can you get it done? No, it's got a port. I pretend it's port. Pretend it's port? John Westwood has had more surgery. Doctors have constructed a stump that they hope will be robust enough to support a prosthetic limb. Which one are we talking about? Yes, the one that was in here, yeah. It's just traumatic. It's, you know, it, he knew what was going to happen, and I didn't. I thought he'd be all right, you know. I knew he'd lose his time, but not a lot, not like that. You get a pain here, and you, you sit and think, God, that hurts, and then you think, but there's nothing there. So what's hurting me? It's ever so weird, I tell you. It's because the brain's trying to find the other foot, you see. John's two operations cost the NHS about £18,000. 
Rehabilitation will cost a further £20,000. But some type 2 patients require even greater levels of care to give them a chance against the disease. Norma Edmonds has already lost both her feet to diabetes. Now she's back in hospital with an infection which is tracking up her leg and threatening her life. First it was my toe. I had to have that amputated and then it went into the bone so I had to have another operation and then it went onto the other foot. So, you know, within the two years, I had um, both feet amputated. No. You're, you're in your 50s still, aren't you? Yeah. How old are you 56. now? 56. You're 56 years old? Yeah. Can I answer that? Please? Of course you can. Yeah, yeah. Can I ring you back, because I've got somebody with me? All right, I'll see you in a bit, bye. Love you. That's the better half. Norma got married at 19. We've been married um, 37 years now. So he was in the pub and um, he went down on his knee and said, will you marry me? And I thought he was joking at first. I was so happy that day. I looked um, so nice there as well. Norma gradually put on weight in her 20s and began to hit acute problems in her 40s. So far, doctors have managed to preserve some mobility for her. This time, it'll be harder. Unfortunately, the infection is not really settling. So we would have to go back and take out more muscle, more skin, uh, more bone from her leg below the knee. And even if we did that, it's quite likely that that wound would never heal. And so she would never get back a, a leg that was useful to her that she would be able to walk on. The alternative is to do an amputation above the knee. Uh, the old curtains were much easier. Most patients who have an above the knee amputation will never walk again and will need costly ongoing care. Hi Norma, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Right. So, do you, do you understand what we're going to be doing? Yeah, the mutation, yes. So, as you know, you, you came into hospital yes. with a lot of infection yes. in the leg, in the left yeah. leg. We agree that probably the best way of getting you out of hospital in the, as quickly as possible yeah. would be to amputate the leg above, the, above the knee, yeah. which is obviously a big step yeah, and, and a big is. decision, but I think that's what you... Yeah. You were quite clear in your own yeah, mind that's, that's what you wanted. wanted. And, and, yeah. and, and that's still your view now, yes. that's what you'd like us to do? That's what I'd okay. like you to do, Okay, yes. okay. See you yeah, later. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, watch your fingers. That's the leg free. We like it to look symmetrical and, and neat and, and tidy. As much as an amputation stump can ever look nice, I think having a good shape is, is important. Um, yeah, it's not so much more it's pretty good. I'm happy, happy with the way it's gone. Thanks. Norma won't be strong enough to leave Heartlands for nearly a month. And the average cost of a single night in hospital is £400. When all the costs to the NHS of type 2 diabetes are added together, the total is an estimated £10.3 billion. That's nearly 10% of the entire NHS budget and is set to continue rising sharply. One way to save type 2 patients from the worst consequences of the disease is bariatric surgery. It could also save the NHS money in the long run. Hi, John. Hi, please. I'm good, thank you. John will have gastric bypass surgery in four weeks, 
As long as he can stick to the pre-op diet. Right, John. The principles there are to create a small stomach, and that should reduce how much portions, how much food you can eat in one go. Good. And part of that is physical, mechanical, and part of that is hormonal, because certain hormones which will be will be released, which will encourage you to feel full. So you can actually walk away from a small plate of food feeling quite satisfied and not hungry. Okay. Yeah, that would be nice. You've got to go on a very low calorie diet. Yes, I'm aware. 800 to 1,000 calories a day, maximum. This, this is not a punishment for you, John. The, the, <laughs> the, reason, the reason why we're doing this is to shrink your liver down. Yes. And yes. Uh, this, will, this will definitely help. How do you feel you're going to get on with this? It's going to be horrendous. I'm going to struggle, but I have to do it, so yeah. I'm going to do the best I can. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. See you soon. Bye now. John hopefully will get a good result. Diabetes resolution after gastric bypass surgery is, is quite an amazing thing to see. Within six weeks or so, we can get them off insulin. But if you feel like you want to suddenly go out and have a large meal, that's not going to be possible without you either being sick or feeling pain. And there is a finality to that that people have to mentally be prepared for. Sharon has completed her crash diet and her bariatric surgery will go ahead today. The main part of her stomach will be cut out, leaving only a narrow tube with much less space for food. Sometimes we have noticed that the tube is too narrow for some of the patients. If this happens, we may need to reoperate on you long term. If you are happy, I would like please to ask for your signature here, print your name underneath and the date for us. Yeah. Thank you. The risk of serious complications is low, but the impact on Sharon's life will be huge. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Today is the, the start of a new life, really, hopefully. So, and hopefully a better one, not a, not a worse one. <laughs> it's not something that you say, well, I can always have it reversed if it doesn't suit. It's a complete life change, so she's going to have to eat differently now for the rest of her life, which I know is the whole idea. Um, I can't even imagine what that will be like. Someone said to me the other day, um, but it suits you being big, that's you, that's who you are, and that's your personality. And everyone knows me as, as me, you know, uh, 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 Sharon, who, she's the, the big girl, she's, you know, Yes, I'm quite bubbly and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, if I'm just a normal, average, slim person, will I just be insignificant, do you know what I mean? <laughs> will I lose me? You know, then I need to find myself a nice, gorgeous hunk of a man then. through surgery, which I know is a risk, when really if I just had willpower and self-control, it wouldn't be necessary. There you go. You know, they're cutting half of your stomach away. We'll do four very small cuts across the top part of the abdomen of the patient. We're going to remove uh, main, main part of the body of the stomach. Nearly 9 in 10 type 2 patients see dramatic improvements after surgery. Recent evidence suggests bariatric surgery not only makes people eat less, but it can also kickstart the body's ailing insulin system. Yeah, give, wait there, wait there, wait there for us, wait there for us. We know that we can treat diabetes with bariatric surgery. It is a cure. We have hard evidence now to use this phrase, it is a cure. At the moment, bariatric surgery is the only way to control the current problem. One more clip, please. Sharon's bariatric surgery cost around 5,000 pounds, 
but it should prevent her from developing complications in the future. This could save the NHS money in the long run, and many doctors think more patients should be offered the treatment. It's an investment that the NHS has to make, so the resources have to be moved from somewhere else towards bariatric surgery, and it's not always easy. Have the clip one, yeah? yeah? Just the dog ear at the end. Be careful of the dog ear, not at all. Yeah. Specimen. This is a, a life changing operation. We removed uh, part of the stomach. It looks like a narrow tube, but actually, when we are eating and drinking, this part of the stomach can really expand and accommodate several liters of volume. Very handy for the result. In the whole of England, there are just 6,000 weight loss operations a year, down on previous years. But if the NHS met the European average, it would do near 50,000, enough to make a small dent in the epidemic. I think it needs to be far more well understood than within the healthcare system. At the moment, I'm not sure whether everybody understands those benefits correctly. Within the NHS, there's been a, a reluctance to embrace bariatric surgery. I wouldn't call it a reluctance. I don't know whether that is the right word. But I, I think it is. Uh, I think the transition has been very slow. Uh, and a lot more people working in the NHS need to be made aware of the benefits of bariatric surgery. Once that is done, perhaps we would start seeing more people preferring bariatric surgery as a treatment and more people being offered surgery as a treatment. For Sharon, the effects of surgery are immediate. I came home last night and I feel as though I've potted around today and feel quite bright and chirpy, really, considering it was only three days ago. I think I'm going to try some oxtail soup. Well, I'm not thrilled by the look of it. Six, six, six teaspoons of soup. The NHS does have a plan to tackle the epidemic. The idea is to intervene earlier to prevent type two patients ever needing expensive hospital treatment. The hope is that hospitals, community services and GPs will work more closely together. But right now, many GPs in the front line of the new prevention strategy say they are already stretched to capacity. Brilliant. Sorry about the wait this morning. Have a seat. Six years ago, we maybe had just over 200 people who had type 2 diabetes. Now we've got over 400. Hi. Absolutely huge amount of our time as a practice is spent um, caring for people with a type 2 diabetes. Are there any vegetables that you do like? I don't mind the um, sprouts. Within primary care, we are limited in the resource that we are allocated. I think that having to try and provide a good quality of care for all the people on our books who have diabetes that we see in our practice of all age groups is very difficult. Say yes to me when I'm touching your feet. Nothing. No. OK. Well, we, we knew that anyway, didn't we? Yeah. Are you able to do any exercise at the moment? No, not really. OK. Oh. It's inevitable that we struggle. We're not coping now, and my main concern is that unless there is a real injection of resource that is targeted into the problem, that we will not really meet the challenge of type 2 diabetes at all. In a cash-strapped NHS, it will be hard to put enough money into prevention and GP care, while limited resources have to be spent on life-threatening cases. I feel like I'm in a, a dip here. Yeah. 
Norma has been at an NHS rehabilitation centre for seven weeks. With help, she has learned to move from bed to chair. How does that feel? Lovely, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. It's getting better every day, sort of thing. Sometimes I've got annoyed with myself because I can't do stuff that I want to do. You know, getting in the car, going out for a drive, going to shops. That's going to take some time. John Westwood is out of hospital too. Okay, well that looks okay. After weeks of physiotherapy, the NHS is gradually helping him to walk again. One, two, three, and stand. Okay. And then start to take a step forward. Take a step with it, small step, and take half your weight through it. Take a step and then step forward with the left. Lovely. I'm going to move out of the way in a minute so you can see yourself in the mirror. Take your weight through there. Brilliant. How does it feel? Much. To me, it means everything. I'm going to walk. Fantastic. You wouldn't believe what I could, you know, it's, it's over the moon, isn't it? You know. <laughs> well, the surgeon that did it, they said, don't worry, it's not the end. And, you know, it stuck with me, that did. That's a big one. I could have lost him, and that's... I'm grateful for the fact that I ain't going to lose him. For 50 years, apart from being at work when we was at work, never been shopping without one another, we never been on holiday without one another, we never went out anywhere without one another, never, ever. And we've been married 50 years. Well, I've got him and that's it. And whatever he wants to do, we'll do, and whatever I want to do, we'll do. It won't stop us. Stopping the type 2 diabetes epidemic is a daunting task. It could still be achieved if bad diets and unhealthy lifestyles changed. We got some stickers somewhere. Charities like Diabetes UK are doing their best. This is five pounds of fat. Now, if you're on a diet, that is realistically what you could probably lose in a month. Would you like to do a free type 2 risk assessment? Would you be interested in finding out your risk of type 2 diabetes? Would you be interested in finding out your risk of type 2 diabetes? It, it can be very frustrating walking down the high street and seeing all the uh, high fat, high sugar, high calorie, cheap food on offer there does seem to still be a huge resistance to looking at changes. I do feel that a lot of what we do is such a waste of time and resource and does leave patients very damaged and disabled. You can still find out your risk. Would you like to come on board and find out your risk? The government has proposed a sugar tax on soft drinks and published a childhood obesity strategy. But many doctors think it needs far tougher action to have any chance of making a difference. The childhood obesity strategy has fallen short of what many people would have hoped. We know that this is a disease that is unrelenting, unforgiving. We are in a crisis now, and it can't be left for healthcare professionals such as myself to endlessly pick up the pieces. It's John O'Hagan's first week without chocolate. If he sticks with his diet, his surgery will go ahead soon. It'll be worth it when I get the surgery, and I won't be able to eat and binge. Right now, it's just awful. It's now 10 to 6. I'm eating my porridge. My next meal will be an apple in four hours and nine minutes. By improving his diet and keeping on top of his medication, Amir has got his diabetes under better control. A month ago, his blood sugar levels were as high as 18. 
it's not that high, but it is like a double figure. So I'd say it's above average high, but not as high as you'd expect. So I'm happy kind of with it. So my goal is trying to get a 6.5 because that is that's perfection because I was reading it. That is the best sugar reading you can get. See, I like that dress. I like that dress. The NHS has given Sharon a new start. It's not what you'd go out to, it's what you'd wear to go to work and stuff in. Three months after surgery, she's lost three stone and her blood sugar is down to normal, non-diabetic levels without medication. Feel fun, feel fun. I, I haven't really got diabetes now and I've, I feel like I've sort of had a lucky escape from it, you know. That could have, you know, in 10 years' time, who knows what would have been happening to me. There are now four million people in the UK with type two diabetes. In 10 years, there will be a million more. The fear is that without fundamental changes, the NHS will not be able to survive the rising costs of this deadly epidemic. In a way, you feel helpless with, with the way things are going. It's probably going to get worse rather than better. 10% of the NHS money is quite, quite a lot. If it continues at the current rate, certainly it will not be sustainable. The consequences are stark. Either the NHS will have to make some hard choices. I am worried the NHS will have to decide what conditions it does or does not treat. And that is a very difficult decision to make. How are you doing, Nathan? Or it will simply run out of money. Diabetes will have a tremendous burden on our National Health Service, which is probably unaffordable. And it would be much cheaper to actually change lifestyles now and prevent people developing these complications than to try and pay for it through the NHS. Right. Well, excellent. How are you going on? Nice to see you. Very resilient, my brothers are. Yeah, I get knocked down, you just pick yourself up and carry on with life, don't you? Details of organisations offering information and support are available at bbc.co.uk forward slash action line or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 08000 680 118.